can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Corey Quinn. You can check him out at CoreyQuinn.com. And Corey, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And um, Stuart Gandalf. Thanks, Stuart. The reason we connected was because of you. And people can check out HealthCareSuccess.com. And um, we'll find out how you know Stuart. Um, I know he... Definitely in the interview talked about, oh my, I listened to Corey's advice. It's the best. I'm like, who is this Corey person? <laughs> Introduce him. Let's have him on the podcast. Here we are. Because he'd be so successful and you know, is listening. I'm 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 all ears. So check yeah. out the one I did with Stuart. Also, I did one with Todd Tasky. Um, he has the second bite podcast, and he basically helps match private equity with agencies and helps sell agencies. And so mm-hmm. it's interesting to hear his thoughts on valuations and what he does to um, help increase value. And he calls it the second bite because Corey, as you know, like when some of the companies he helps gets bought by private equity, they make a chunk, they roll some equity in when they sell again, sometimes they make more off the second bite than they do in the first, which is Mm -hmm. a interesting concept. So uh, right. Todd Tasky does a great interview. Um, and there's many, many more. So check them out. Um, a lot on the agency space, SaaS space. Um, Corey, like me, geeks out on the agency space. So check those out. Uh, more on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We are an easy button for a company to launch and run your podcast. We do the full strategy, the full accountability, and the full execution around that. Um, Corey, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they could just worry about building the relationship and running their business. You know, For me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, and I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people in companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Corey has a podcast. So we'll actually mm-hmm. talk about that too. You can go to rise25.com and learn more or email us support at rise25.com. We have a bunch of free ep- resources on the episodes. Basically, everything that we recommend doing, we share on the podcast. You know, top tools, mm-hmm. software, strategies. We have episodes for that. So check those out. And I'm excited to introduce Corey Quinn. He's a 25 year plus record of success as an entrepreneur, a sales leader, a marketing executive. He had an in house role as Scorpion's CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. While there, the agency grew from 20 million to 150 million in recurring revenue in under seven years. You know, most companies, you know, Corey don't get to 20 million agencies, 20 million, let alone 150 million. Um, he has a mission now to help a thousand plus agency owners, probably at some point, thousands, tens of thousands, Mm -hmm. you know, unlock growth by specializing in a vertical market. And I just say, Corey, you know, not everything, you know, it sounds amazing, but not everything he's touched turned to gold. He's learned from the school of hard knocks. Oh yeah. After college, he had two startups that failed after raising $3 million. You know, I was looking at that, Corey, I'm like, I think you were just a little early. Like it, it was, if you had that startup later, it would have gone gangbusters, but we 1999 were, and streaming yeah, service yeah, was, yeah, yeah, that's too hard, you know. Like, that's at that point. Um, so yeah. he has those, he's worked in the agency space back to 2007. So, Corey, thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. I am super excited to be here, Jeremy. So, let's start off and just talk about what you're doing now. We'll get to, you know, all the questions and you know, that everyone has been asking me when I said, I'm going to have Corey on, like ask him all these things. I have a list of 72 <laughs> things. What did they do at Scorpion? How do they do this? We'll yeah. get to that, I promise. Right. But mm-hmm. talk about what you're doing now. And well, I'm going to share you know, my screen because I'm going to show your website a little bit. Um, ooh, so, but, yeah. What are you up to now? 
Yeah. So right now, today, I am uh, actively working on a revision on a book that I'm going to be shipping off to my amazing editor this Sunday. <laughs> so this is like literal real time. And so uh, this I've hired this amazing editor to help uh, me to create a, a hopefully a really useful and impactful book. It is called the working the title is Focus Vertical. And it's all about my five-step process that I take my one-on-one -on -one clients through, my consulting clients through, which, by the way, are agencies, to help them to go from a generalist to a vertical market specialist. There are five steps. In the book, I teach you how to do it. There's a ton of resources and worksheets and templates and videos that support it. And my hope and promise with the book is that you'll be able to um, make that transformation by using the book um, independent, independently. So that's what that's a big thing I'm working on. Uh, second to that, I, I would just say that I am uh, extremely passionate about helping others to uh, create a bigger impact in their lives, and their families. Um, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I don't have all the answers and I'm, I'm learning every day, but that's something that, that energizes me. Um, and and uh, I hope to make that impact for myself in the world. And the way that I'm doing that today is, as you mentioned, I'm on a mission to help a thousand agency owners transform themselves from an agency that is, you know, very founder led, founder centric from a sales perspective, operations and so on and so forth to really scaling up. And the way that I know how to do that um, and I can help people is through becoming a vertical market specialist. That's what we did at Scorpion. That's what I do with my, my coaching clients. That's the people who I talk to on my podcast, people who've been through that transformation themselves and have built in, in some cases, seven, eight, figure um, agencies in a vertical market space. Um, I've, I've interviewed on my podcast here on the screen. I've, I've interviewed, um, you know, uh, folks like Chris Dreyer from, um, from rankings.io. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Chris. And, and, and a lot of the other, a lot of the other, you know, folks who have taken this verticalized approach and have found wild success. So that's what I'm passionate about. That's where I believe I can help people to be successful. And so that's, that's what I'm up to. Talk about the five steps. And, and actually, one of yeah. my favorite episodes, and if you're you know listening, um, there's a video version of this, and um, you're looking, we're at Corey, uh, Corey's website, CoreyQuinn.com, and we're at the podcast page. Um, my favorite one was um, the person who worked with you at Scorpion. Oh, yeah. That's one of the, uh, that's my first that was episode. one of the first episodes, I yeah, think. Yeah, that was um, the for Jamie Adams. He was my counterpart there. It's all the way at the bottom. But um, he, God, there's so many good guests. Um, he is instrumental in the growth of Scorpion. The The quick story with Scorpion, I arrived in 2015. It was, a, like I said, a $20 million company, primarily working with attorneys, founder-led business. Um, and he had kind of grown the, the agency to that point using really a lot of local talent, his friends and family from the local Santa Clarita Valley. And he, well, they, they really wanted to grow to the next level. And so I came in sort of from the outside, although I lived in LA, I came in from the outside, Ed, um, not, 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 I didn't know anyone there. And so did Jamie Adams. He came from Reach Local and the two of us kind of teamed up on a sales and marketing approach to um, really take the company from where it was. And I could talk about what that was like to, you know, able to, to, to scale it up, not only within the attorney um, market, but we also uh, went cross vertical to home services and franchise and a couple others. Yeah, it was interesting because in the conversation when you talked, mm. there were, I think, a hundred people at the company and ten salespeople. And when you <laughs> talked to him, there were a hundred salespeople. Yeah, so the same <laughs> amount of people were at the company was the sales team. Yes, the entire sales team today is was the entire company back in 2015. <laughs> so. <laughs> walk, walk through the five steps for a second. Okay, sure. So the the context is this is a uh, generalist agency that has you know been in business. They have a book of business, and they've um, they've been successful, but they they've been unsuccessful. Let's say in scaling, getting to the next level. Um, a lot of their 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 uh, their business is founder led, meaning the sales are dependent on the founder going out and getting deals. Um, they're working with businesses of all shapes and sizes. Every client they have to learn their business. They have to. 
Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of sort of project management heavy type of uh, engagements. And they realized that, hey, if I really want to grow and I want to grow aggressively, then the way to get to get there is you have to build more repeatable systems. And one of the ways you could do that is by focusing on a vertical market. So that's when I come in. Uh, that's what I can that's what I can help with. The first step is Are they convinced at this point, like someone coming to you, are they like, okay, I know I need to do this, or do they still need some convincing? If they're not convinced, I'm not the right person for them. They're they're not ready. Well, maybe they're open, but maybe <laughs> I'm not saying they're they're not they're closed off. But yeah, you know, yeah. there's that constant conversation. While I have these, you you've heard it a million times, right? Yeah. I have these whatever thirty clients, and you know, I don't want to neglect these like five. You know, half of my business has come from from this niche, but. I have a smattering of this other niche. Like, yeah. what do I do, Corey? Right? Sure. Well, the 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 reality is is that by focusing in on a vertical market, you're going to update your website, you're going to update your positioning, but your current book of business, they don't really care about that. They're not going to, you know, up and leave you as a result of that. You you refresh your website with different messaging. They don't. That, that's that's not that's not a thing that happens. The reason why they would leave is if you stopped providing value to them, right? So as long as you're continuing to, to meet their, their needs and exceed their needs, that that's not an issue. It's more of a focus, focusing mechanism going forward. How, how do we, um, you know, how do we become more uh, streamlined uh, in, and in intentional and focused in, in everything we do? Um, you know, the, I think the, one of the big um, objections, I think I would call it an irrational belief or, or irrational fear is that when you, focus your agency on a narrow niche or a vertical market, you're effectively reducing the total addressable market, the number of businesses you're going to say yes to. And that just psychologically, this, this concept of, you know, loss aversion, people just don't like, you know, this idea of pulling something away from me. But I think what ends up happening, not for everyone, and, and this is not, you know, I'm not preaching to say that this is absolutely the only way to grow an agency, but in these cases, um, you know, they uh, they realize that they have to stop saying yes to everybody. And that's really the basis of, of a conversation with me. Yep. So what's the first step? First step is to choose the vertical market that they want to focus in on. And the way that I, I prefer doing that is to use data to help guide that decision. So it's not just, a, well, you know, I kind of I kind of feel like, we should be focusing on this area. And most founders will already have a feeling about which direction they want to go in. And that's fine. But the process I like to take them through, it, it, uh, it is data driven so that we can validate that, that feeling to make sure that, yes, indeed, they are good clients. They stick around for a long time. They generate profitable revenue, that your, um, that your team's like working with them, that they meet the future vision of, your, of, your, of the company that you're trying to build. And that probably very importantly, that, the the vertical itself, the market itself, is viable from a um, uh, market sizing perspective. Is it a growing industry? Or is it a shrinking industry? So we need to go through all of these um, uh, these 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 data points and these re this research to really uncover a high quality vertical that truly matches the 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 agency where they're at. Yeah, love it. Choose a vertical. Also, hopefully, they have some proven success in that vertical. Yes. Um, What's next? Next step, next couple of steps are really mapping the message to the market. Now that you've identified the market, who the buyer is, then you really want to get smart on how do we communicate that, hey, we're an insider and we know how to solve very um, the, you know, the very unique, sophisticated problems that just you, Mr. and Mrs. Plumber, are, are, are uh, experiencing. So the way we do that is, number one, we interview their plumbing clients. I'm going to use the example of a plumber, but we interview their plumbing clients. Part of the decision that went into, uh, part of the data that went into the decision of be choosing plumbers, doesn't have to be plumbers, but whatever it is, <laughs> was the fact that we have evidence that, yeah, they're good clients. So we'll go interview them. And what we're doing is what's called a buyer's journey interview to understand what were they doing before they, they uh, partnered with us, what, what changed that, that caused them to look for a change, you know, a new agency in this case, what was the process they took. And we interview five to seven of their, their clients to really begin to uncover and look for patterns in their responses. And we take those patterns and that informs our messaging and our positioning. The next thing we do is we do competitive, third step is competitive research. 
um, you know, when you are heavily focused as a founder on relationships and you're networking to get deals, your competitors matter less because people are typically not shopping. If someone, if, if someone met you as a founder through Vistage or through EO or one of these things, they're probably not going to shop too hard because they're relying on that personal relationship that they have with you. But when you are attracting businesses who you do, who you don't have a personal relationship, they're definitely going to be shopping. And so why that's why I'm a big fan of understanding what is the competitive landscape um, for that buyer? Who are, who are they going to compare my agency with in the buying process? And what we're looking for in that competitive research is what is the messaging and positioning that these uh, other agencies are focusing their marketing on? Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to arrive to a differentiated positioning for the agency. And we are going to take the, the data that we got and the insights from the client interviews, as well as the competitive research. And we will go through a positioning and messaging exercise where we're going to be getting clear about, well, what are the attributes our ideal client wants in an agency? And then how can we find some white space from a positioning perspective to really claim that? And then we also talk about point of view, which I think is really important, especially in the agency space, because it is so undifferentiated. Our point of view is ultimately our why. People, like Simon Sinek said, you know, people don't um, hire you for what you do. They, they hire you for why you do it, right? So if you're unable to articulate your why in a meaningful way that the, that the buyer uh, recognizes and values, then uh, you're, you're effectively invisible. So we work on the point of view as well. Once we get all that, uh, that groundwork, We've identified uh, who we want to target, how we're going to target to them uh, in a meaningful and impactful way. Then it's about going out and building inbound, outbound, and relationship-based marketing strategies. And these are not just generic strategies. These are vertical-specific strategies. There are things you do when you have a vertical focus. There are things you do from an inbound perspective that are different. There are things you do from an outbound perspective that are different, and things you do from a relationship-based uh, uh, basis that are different now that you are focused on a vertical. So. I, uh, I talk about uh, what those are and how to deploy those meaningfully so that you start to see results in the short term. And then is there a fifth one or is that, is that, that is a combination? The yeah. It's like Sorry, a four great. and five. Yeah. Yeah. Got exactly. it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I want to talk about, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I'm going to pull up your website because you eat your own dog food. Okay. Yeah. And you are, you um, are always thinking of obviously the vertical, right? Hence yeah. your podcast, um, yeah. the go-to vertical podcast <laughs> or the, the vertical focus, go to go market, to market yeah. Yeah. Uh, vertical go to market podcast. Um, yeah. and you are working in the copywriter now to do this very thing. Um, and, yeah. and the funny thing is you could, with your experience, be like, I don't need to do this. I know, you know, I'm focused on agencies, but you're still going through the process and, yeah. You know, we we talked before we record. It's like I've heard you say agencies, and also you've helped B two B SaaS companies too. But yes. you're like, no, Jeremy. Right now, I'm really just focused on agencies. Not saying you can't help B two B SaaS companies, but it sounds like you are really zeroing in on agencies. Yeah. What is other some of the the copy that you're thinking through with the copywriter, and as you're interviewing your clients, how yeah. is this how is this going to change what we see sure. it now? Sure. So the, the the biggest thing is a functional change, actually. The primary CTA on my website is Let's Talk, which is more about let's set up a meeting. If you click on that, it's going to go to a form. And um, what I find is that the people who ultimately want to work with me are people who have joined my email list and they have listened to my podcast. And so this is not the front and center CTA that I need to have on my website. I came to that realization. Mm. And so what my, my new, uh, my new, above the fold and back to the, most of the homepage will be focused on joining my newsletter. Yeah. So, so here be, you could see, I mean, I think, wait, where was it? Uh, oh, your newsletter right here. So yeah. you can, and I joined, um, you want a one minute high impact tip every day, sign up, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the copy on the homepage is going to be really fo like the, the above the fold is going to be focused on like, you know, what the big promises and the benefits of, of joining this. And then the rest of the homepage or most of the rest of the homepage is going to be about me, my story, um, and then the things that um, make me distinctive in being able to help the specific audience I'm trying to help, um, you know, what makes me different and, and uniquely positioned to do that. So from a copywriting standpoint, not much is going to change on that. 
No, I think the, my story is not in there. It's not front and center um, today. So we're working on how do we articulate that? And the story is, is, is focused on. Yeah. Um, it's you know, on your about page, but not on the, on the yeah. main page. I mean, yeah. 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 And, and I'm we're even, we're even going to change this a little bit uh, potentially. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, I like to hear the thought process through that. I mean, cause people can still contact you. Right. But you're going to want people to sign up for your newsletter, deliver value to them through the, your, um, uh, your blog and podcast first. Yeah, exactly. And I, what I find is that uh, there are a lot of agency consultants out there and that's great. Uh, there's a lot of agencies that need help. So uh, need help. That, that's great. But I think um, by giving them an opportunity to get on my newsletter. So I do a five, five, five uh, emails a week. So it's a lot of email. Uh, they're short and sweet. They're, they're meant to be really high impact. But the point is, is that they, they will get a real sense for how I think, who I am, what I value and how I work. And for some people it's like, yeah, that's exactly, you know, he knows exactly what we need. We need. Um, and that's really my, my intention is to, is to bring them into the newsletter and then give them an opportunity to learn more from me. So we'll walk through some case examples, um, Corey, but first, so the way people engage with you, typically, I'm looking at your services page, yeah. um, they can work with you privately, a private coaching call, and then there's an advisory retainer, and then a vertical go to market roadmap. Yes. So there, yes. Yeah. So the, 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 yeah, those are the three, those are all three of those I'm, I'm personally involved. So there's not much of a. Uh, today there's no there's no products I have available that are not me like that I'm not, I'm directly involved unless they get your book when it's out when it's out right. and that yeah. and there's other things coming as well but yes cool so let's talk about um the a couple examples right yeah. and there was before we were talking about agency targeting law firms and yes. some of the things you did with them and, and how they grew. Sure. So this was a, this is an agency that, like you said, they're targeting law firms. They're very, um, uh, very aggressively growing, very charismatic CEO and chief marketing officer. But their uh, their sales, the specific go to market around the sales, they would generate a ton of leads, but their conversion rate on their leads was 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 pretty poor. And so this was something where it was less about helping them to identify their uh, their vertical and getting really clear uh, on them. But it was more around the work that I did at Scorpion with uh, in partnership with Jamie around how do we get a sales team to start to really perform? Okay. And uh, and so it was did part this of it company, was around, what did their sales team look like? Because I think they you said they were around twenty thousand dollars a month in recurring revenue. What what did their sales yeah. team look like? It was it was a three to four person, you know, sales team who were considered to be quote unquote closers. Okay. And they would uh, they would receive a bunch of leads from these events that the that the agency would hold. So, uh, but they were they were struggling with um, closing them. And part of the problem was that they were selling the 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 they didn't have a very strong sales training program. And they were selling the way that when I arrived, they were selling a very productized service. And so it became much more of a transactional sale where they're talking about. You know, hi, Mr. And Mrs. Attorney. This is the package. You know, these are the features. These are the benefits. Take it or leave it. And what we brought in was more of a consultative uh, process, where it was, um, you know, okay, thank you for you know hopping on the call with me. Tell me about what you're currently doing. Tell me about what you'd like to do. What are the what is what what happens if you don't make any changes and what's blocking you? Right. What are that consultative um, sale? And they they realized uh, that they uh, the value in this they actually changed out a number of their sales team um, from from people who maybe were not open to this new consultative approach to selling, and um, we brought so I helped bring in uh, a new sales deck, a new proposal, the whole sales system, and as a result of this, they went from twenty million sorry twenty thousand in monthly uh, MRR monthly recurring revenue. In new business to a hundred thousand in monthly recurring business. So a dramatic shift where it was the, you know, the takeaway here is that they had a lot of potential in the, in the, in the business and the leads, the way that they were running sales was causing them to not maximize that potential. It sounded like with certain members, they had to go to the drawing board and revisit that. What mm -hmm. did you want them to look for um, in the new salespeople from like, the consultative side. 
the play there because they wanted to move quickly is that they realized they needed to find people who were already selling to attorneys in this new way. So people they didn't necessarily have to train in this new concept, but just basically bring them over and let, and let them apply this this existing uh, play to the to the system. So how do they find people? Do they? They actually were were very aggressive. They went uh, and found some competitors who they who they respected, and they actually had conversations with those salespeople. It seems like a lot of for twenty thousand a month. Does that seem like a what what a company doing that should have as a sales team? That, that seems from the people I've talked to, that seems like a lot of salespeople for that amount of revenue. Yeah, or no, it I was. Wrong? Yeah, no, they, and they just weren't productive. They just, yeah, it was not working <laughs> for sure. They were, I think the the CEO was uh, trying to fix it by putting more bodies in it. And it was more of a, of a process and systems issue and that bodies, more bodies wasn't going to fix. So you come in, it, this kind of reorganize, reorganize the sales process. What do you mm-hmm. do as far as um, the sales training? You said the sales training program wasn't, uh, amazing. It wasn't how they wanted. It was, what a, did you it was do a, Google, it was a Google doc basically. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it was, here's the script. Yeah. Cause so, I know you've talked about this before on yeah. adding value. And I'm curious with Scorp, even with Scorpion, um, you've talked about, you know, you're not going in there um, just saying, Hey, these are the features, but you were trying to understand. And even, I think you've talked about listening to their calls and actually getting deeper into the understanding yeah. of their business. That wasn't specific, that that issue was not specific to this specific client, uh, but in general with Scorpion. So um, we were targeting uh, attorneys, and attorneys they they the way they run their business is they have a gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper's job is to make sure everyone in the world, uh, like Scorpion, does not actually get access to the attorney. Like they're they're screening out all these vendors who want to you want to talk to the attorney, and so um, we we did cold calling for a while. It was very unsuccessful. What we determine what we found out was uh and i got this in part from you know the the ceo of scorpion was to send them a gift as a first touch and it's not just any kind of gift like you don't send them a, a pen with your logo on it uh you send them something that is unique that's striking and that it leaves an impression we called it a usi and what that looked like was in this case uh cookies we would send these amazing gourmet cookies in a fedex box overnight and it would bypass the gatekeeper because the, the the attorney would get all the FedEx boxes right on their desk. They would all open up this box, this strange box. And in it was this beautiful tin of cookies to open it up. And the cookies are amazing. Like it has, you have to use amazing cookies for this, but the cookies in the tin would end up uh, being shared around the office because everyone wanted to, you know, try this amazing cookie. And then of course the next part of the conversation was, well, who brought the cookies? And it's like, well, this company Scorpion. <laughs> so we had this buzz around the office. By the time the salesperson called, it would, you know, the conversation was, uh, the dynamic was very different. It was, it went from, you know, resistance to the gatekeeper saying, oh, you're the ones from Scorpion who sent the cookies. Hold on, let me put you through to the attorney. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> the best so way through the stomach. I love it. Yeah, it, it is. And it and it it's um it's powerful what sending a thoughtful gift ahead of time will do to warm up a otherwise cold prospect. What else have you seen that has worked mm-hmm. or that you've liked? Not not necessarily that Scorpion did, but you've seen because yeah. I think I saw on one of your sites, um, there was like big things of brownies. Uh, it was, it was some yeah. kind of uh, mix. What mm-hmm. else have you seen that you like that may give ideas in other industries for people? Sure. So, and that's a really good point because at Scorpion, we did a lot of, uh, we worked with a couple of different verticals and so we wouldn't, you know, cookies kind of work everywhere to be honest, cause who doesn't like great cookies, but, um, we did things like for instance, in home services during COVID, COVID obviously was a, was a crazy uh, and, and it disrupted time for all businesses of all shapes and sizes. Um, but we wanted to continue to support the, the, um, the, the home services vertical. And so we sent out a gift box to our prospects and the gift box was a um, sort of a padded box. You open it up and in, in the open, in the flap of the actual video, I'm sorry, the box was a video player, like an LCD screen. And in there was about a 25 minute training, a free training specifically for home service businesses and how to weather the storm as it relates to their business and their marketing, right? So it was this beautiful free training. They'd open it up 
And then in the actual box itself were N95 masks, those, those face masks, a book about leading through change from a thought leader in home services. So it wasn't like a Scorpion written book. It was a book from someone in their, in their space. Um, and then we also uh, included, I think it was um, uh, uh, gloves, like the blue gloves, right? And, and we would send that across as just a care package. Like, hey, you know, we're thinking about you in this tough time. We wanted to, to uh, you know, have this and, you know, hopefully it's helpful type of thing, right? Yeah. And, yeah. I know, uh, you know, Scorpion is not a nonprofit. So um, <laughs> with the, with the, that's not, I mean, I've seen some of those boxes. I've gotten some of them. They're not inexpensive, you know, to send yeah. just without anything in them, just with the yeah. video thing. How do you decide on what your budget and what you're going to spend on something like that? And I'm wondering sure. how that fits into the whole sales process. Like you mentioned, yeah. you're sitting ahead of time and how that works. But. Sure. So the, everything begins with the list. Like the list is the strategy, as they say. And so the way that we would do this uh, and the way that um, I've done this elsewhere, it's not just at Scorpion, is um, you really want to make sure that whoever you send a, a thirty dollar to one hundred and fifty dollar gift to is super qualified, and you don't want to leave that up to our friends over at in, um, uh, Zoom Info or Apollo or any of these places, right? You really have to be careful and intentional with the list. So you start with the list. Um, it helps if you're a verticalized. So if you're a vertically focused agency, you could um, you know make sure that whatever you send is. Uh, has you know copy and, and and marketing that's very re relevant to the vertical right so the example is the um the box of the home service businesses that was not just a generic box it was specific to home service businesses um and so once you develop a really great list um you know uh, again depends on the dynamics of the business but you really want to make sure that whoever you send this to if you know that if you can get them on a call that you have a good chance of closing them as new business um, uh, meaning that they're super qualified, right? That, that they are, would be a great client. So you don't want to send one of these out, get them on the call and realize at that point, oh gosh, you know, <laughs> this guy doesn't have any money or whatever it is, right? So the, the list really is the strategy. Um, it goes back to what you said with one of the steps was, is really goes back to interviewing the best clients. And then mm -hmm. you're kind of documenting the exact attributes of those exact clients. So when you're pairing yes. the list down, you're looking at that. Exactly. You got it. That's exactly right. So you're using evidence to be able to create a really high quality list. And, you know, frankly, today, this gifting falls into the category of outbound. And the, the motion today is all about volume. It's about spamming your TAM. It's about you know, how big of an email list can I get to send this, you know, these this series of three emails out. Like that is that is the wrong way to do it. I'm much more about quality of the list. I don't care if there's 100 people on the list, um, you know, as long as it's super, super high quality list. Then I'll then I will mail a gift to that, that person. And so one of the things that you can do to increase the likelihood that you'll get a meeting is um, send something that is unique, right? You want to send something that is something they've never seen before. No one's ever sent it. People are sending gifts these days. So you know, think outside the box. You want it to be striking. You want to interrupt their day, right? You don't want just going to send something that's going to end up in a you know a pile somewhere. You want them to like put this in their hands. They want to like turn it around and show it to other people. You want to you know, leave an impression, and it has to be striking. Like if oh like, like leave leave them saying oh this was interesting, right? So there's a there's a high bar when it comes to sending these gifts. You can't just you know uh, mail it in as they say. <laughs> Sorry for the pun, but uh, you know that, that those will help. And then what you have to do really is follow it up with a sales outreach. Just because you send an amazing box of cookies uh, doesn't mean they're going to pick up the call, the phone and give you a call. But you do need to call them and at the right time when they're talking about you, right? When the buzz is uh, you know, all about Scorpion in the office, that's when you want to call uh, versus two weeks later when they've forgotten all about you, right? So there's a, there's a bit of a, well, I, I would call this a, a marketing-led sales outreach or outbound program. That's the way to kind of run it. And then the other the other piece of it is you don't just do it once, one and done. Right? You need to be persistent and uh and consistent over time. And so what that means is I'll give you an example. So uh every dentist as an, you know in this specific example, every dentist gets a new website on average every 3 years. Let's just say. I didn't know that. 
Yeah. So, and, and the technology behind dent, uh, dental websites is expanding and, you know, the, the functionality is changing. And so if we got a list of that super high quality uh, list of dentists, maybe multi, multi uh, doctor, multi-location practices that we knew they had a great budget and that, that we could uh, certainly help out. We knew that if we would market to them consistently, directly through outbound, through gifting every over a period of three years, at some point during that, they will come to the realization that they need to update their website and they're, they're, it's likely they're going to call us, at least put us on the consideration list, which is where we want to be, right? And so understanding what the life cycle of your product is, how often does your typical target audience typically shop and making sure that you're present throughout that period. You do that to a large enough group, you're going to start getting some nice res results from this. How often do you recommend sending in that case over three years? Well, um, it depends. So he goes back to your original question, I think, which is how, how do you afford all this? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, uh, it is. If you have $150 million, you can afford it. No, but like for someone who doesn't. Yeah. So, yeah. so this, it's a great question. And, I, and, and I'm going to answer it maybe a little differently, which is that um, you really have to look at it from a lifetime value perspective. Um, so for instance, if you, uh, if you make $10,000 a month, I'm sorry, $10,000 a year on a client and they stay with you one year, the lifetime value is $10,000. They stay with you for three years, it's $30,000. Well, why this is relevant is that you probably pay a lot more to generate a $30,000 client than a $10,000 client. And so it goes back to the business fundamentals. Are, are you providing a great value and service for your clients? And are they staying with you? And if they're not, then that's really where you want to start uh, start investigating because the more you can uh, extend the lifetime of a, of a recurring sort of revenue client, the more value they are to you and the more, uh, more you're able to spend on the front end to acquire them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, direct response, you can measure that, you know, like mm -hmm. if they like, go, okay, uh, if these hundred people, I'm going to spend whatever amount, you know, a thousand dollars and you get a client that's worth 10,000, you can reinvest in that program and start sending every single one of those people something uh, every couple months. Um, I want to point out, I did an episode, people can check out with John Rulin of Giftology, oh, yes. who um, is a master at this. So I listened mm -hmm. to that one because he is a master of, of gifting high quality things. Um, but speaking of sales cycle, right, um, you know, Corey, because you know, in that case, you, you, you have certain things that you know with a dentist, like over three years. There was a company you worked with that actually um, you help with this, the sales cycle piece of things and, and shorten yeah. that sales cycle. And I, I think you call it, you have a yeah. certain name for it. So I'll let you go over it. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll share with you what I think you're referring yeah. to. And you correct me if uh, along the way. I think it's, so. it's the cookie strategy, but I'm, I'm not oh, sure. Oh yeah, that... That, that's what I was referring to. Okay, yeah. The, so this is, this is a company that... Um, was struggling with getting and keeping appointments uh, and then closing them. And so this is a gentleman who deployed the cookie strategy, which is effectively doing the list vetting and doing the sending out of the cookies, right? What we just talked about. And as a result of that, uh, he was able to increase his lead to conversion rate, uh, um, sorry, lead to appointment rate um, by 50%. So he was able to get 50% more appointments out of his leads just by running this play. And then the cost to book an appointment um, was down about 70%. Despite including additional costs, he was able to lower everything, you know, lower the cost by reducing a lot of the other junk that wasn't driving value. I love it. Yeah. So um, there you go. Let's it talk works. about, you know, the first step you said, which is choose vertical. Okay. Yeah. And um, I reached out to a bunch of agency owners. So I got some questions, but one of them is, you know, in the agency space, someone let's say serves lawyers, right? You could even niche mm -hmm. within lawyers, mm -hmm. right? And one one person was saying, well, they they serve a, several lawyers and PI lawyers has a, a majority, let's say, of their business um, that they serve, but they serve other lawyers and the PIs they pay well, it's competitive, super competitive. So uh, yes, they were kind of thinking through what other, you know, how Scorpion did it um, as far as what other type of law firms, mm -hmm. you know, should they think about? Because it, it's, you know, as they do serve them, it is super competitive space. Sure. 
So it is, I can attest, it's super competitive, especially for personal injury attorneys. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons why is because personal injury attorney budgets are higher because the value per their client is higher, right? So they're able to spend more to acquire. So those are attractive um, candidates for for agencies. Uh, and the, the, however, they're not the only type of practice area in legal that is, um, uh, that that has relatively more budget. I would say other other practice areas are family law, criminal defense, potentially bankruptcy, uh, immigration. Um, these are all these are all um, definitely viable. We we targeted them um, at, at Scorpion. Um, I would say, however, there is a way to like um, in addition to just niching all the way down to let's say personal injury attorneys who only focus on um, you know trucking accidents. Uh, with class action lawsuits. Like that's all we do, which is a very narrow market, by the way. Um, <laughs> there's another way you could do it, which is clarifying what your um, what your point of view is. And a point of view is really, it gets down to the why. Like, why are you doing what you're, what you're doing? I'm not sure if I mentioned it on this, but Simon yeah. Sinek, mm -hmm. yeah, he mentioned. So um, the, I'll give you an example of a law firm. Someone I recently... Um, interviewed on my podcast. It's Nomos Marketing. It's a husband and wife team. He's the attorney. She's the marketer. And the thing that the, the market that they're going after are the the smaller attorneys who are underserved by agencies. They're the ones that don't get access to the sophisticated marketing strategies that the big agencies uh, do. They care about the local little guy, the, the one-stop solo practice guy who really makes a big impact in their community. That's who they're for. Right. That's their why they want to support that guy. And so if I'm a solo practitioner, I'm looking at these bigger players. I'm also looking at this Nomos marketing. Well, it's like, wow, like they're kind of built for me. Like I'd prefer to work with these guys because they get me right. They 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 they're fighting for my causes. Right. So that goes back to understanding what is your point of view? What is your why? And being able to articulate that in the market as a way to differentiate. One of the questions, Corey, that someone asked, and it was more on the agency level, but mm. Um, you talk, we talked about, there's an HR tech company, but, but yeah. someone asked me the almost the exact same question, which is they're, let's say they're stuck. They're yes. stuck at a couple million dollars. Mm. They're an agency. What do I do? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll uh, there's, there's a, a lot of different things you could do, uh, but with this limited information, I can share with you what I've done with a client that was in a similar spot. So, uh, HR tech in the sort of the, the learning and development space. He had, uh, the CEO had, had been in business for about five years, had an amazing product that was far superior that I learned uh, it, it, doing the research. I learned that it was a far superior product, differentiated um, product that uh, than any of their competitors, and they were stuck at $3 million. The challenge was, is that they were serving 29 different verticals at this little $3 million company, 29 different verticals, and they were trying to compete against these massive HR tech companies, like a billion dollar budgets. And so they were, they were sort of doing the peanut butter strategy, which is like kind of spreading everything like super thin. And so as a result of the work that we did, we identified a single market that they need to focus on going through the process I mentioned, and that was restaurant, uh, chain restaurants. Those are the ones that they had the best clients, best results, great, great testimonials, so on and so forth. And as a result of that, they, they completely narrowed their focus, put it all 80% of the business on, I'd say 70% of the business on, uh, on restaurants. And they began to go to restaurant conferences, speaking, um, uh, at the conferences themselves. In fact, they're at a conference right now talking about that, talking about, uh, HR. Um, they, uh, started doing a podcast tour, so on and so forth. And it really ultimately helped align the business, uh, from a marketing perspective, a sales perspective, a product perspective, which has made a massive impact in their ability to gain traction in the single vertical. Yeah. Um, I have uh, 72 questions I need to get in the next four <laughs> minutes. So I know. <laughs> um, no, but so many, so many questions here. But um, I did want to find out, and you could answer, answer this briefly, but, you know, from 20 million going to 150 million. Sure. What were some of the key things that had to change at those at which, um, you know, I guess, revenue levels? 
My goodness. So, so much. We had to mature as like, as people, as a company, like you can imagine a hundred people, you know, everyone's name, a thousand people. A uh, hundred people. Know. I don't even think I know everyone's name. <laughs> I know, but, yeah. right, I didn't. <laughs> but, um, but, but definitely you, you there's a lot more infrastructure, a lot more, uh, like you have to be a lot different business um, uh, at the, at the thousand person. So, um, so I'll answer it, uh, maybe from a sales and marketing perspective, which I could speak more, more directly to. Um, and so the, when, when I arrived, it was mostly, it was a small age, small sales team, relatively speaking, and they were, um, pretty much just fielding inbounds, right? They didn't have to pick up the phone. It was like all the call, the phone would ring and they'd do a one call close and they'd ring the, like they'd, they'd hit the, the gong, right? And they'd have the gong in the, in the sales office. It was a really fun environment. The challenge was, is that. They were unable to grow as fast as the CEO, the ambitious CEO, Rustin, wanted to grow. He's just he's just an ambitious guy. He really wants to help people. And so that was one of the reasons why I came in. So we formalized the inbound process, which means that we made sure that we were maximizing the number of inbounds. But more importantly than that, I'd say, is bringing in an outbound strategy. So um, as we know, only 3 to 5% um, of any target market is I'm trying to think if it's three or five percent. Let's call it five percent. But five percent of any target market is coming inbound per quarter. And so if you want to grow aggressively, you can't just rely on that whatever percentage of that five percent who's doing the shopping to to call you or to, to to reach out to you. You need to do outbound. And it was by by introducing this outbound discipline we talked about in the in the episode with Jamie um, that it really helped us to to quickly grow the business. Once we had established that, then it was about finding the next vertical, taking the best practices from our legal vertical, applying it to the next one, and then the next one. So it was that kind of motion. Um, I know we have one minute left, so I have one <laughs> last question, Corey, sure. I promise. But uh, everyone can check out CoreyQuinn.com. It's C-O-R-E-Y-Q-U-I-N-N.com to learn more. Last question is just mentors, mentors in your journey. Um, yeah. Mentors in the agency space. It could be distant mentors to, or, to like books that you like, but who are some sure. of the mentors that you've had? Sure. Well, I'm currently in Ben Hardy, Dr. Ben Hardy's mastermind program. Uh, he's the author of 10X is Easier Than yeah. 2X. Uh, he's co-author with Dan Sullivan. And who Not How. Yeah. Who Not How and Personality is Impermanent. And so I, I I think all of his content's great. He's all over YouTube. Um, I've also worked with Jonathan Stark, who is more of a consultant to soloists. I'm actually not going to be a soloist. Uh, I, um, in other words, I, I'm not going to be a one-person company. I have a lot of people around me. So, but I was uh, working with him to really kind of get my consulting off the ground. Um, there are people in the agency uh, consulting space. Um, I'm getting to know people uh, like uh, uh, Drew McMillan from uh, AMI, uh, Agency Management Yeah, I've Institute. had Drew on the podcast. Yep. Agency Management Institute. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then Carl Smith over at uh, the, the, the Bureau of Digital. It's a really high quality group of agency owners who are all in there together working through uh, their growth challenges and, and supporting each other. So those are those are some of the great uh, resources that I've been tapping into. Cool. I love it. I don't know if you know yeah. Jason Swank, but he's another one. Yeah. one. Yeah. Jason Swank. I, I was on his podcast not too long ago. <laughs> Boom. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, Corey, I wanted to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out CoreyQuinn.com. And thanks, Corey. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate the opportunity. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.